Welcome to part two of module seven. In this part, we are going to focus on different rational number procedures that could be emphasized within intensive intervention. So our objectives for this part of the module are to learn different computational models for addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division of fractions, and then we're going to just touch briefly upon some of the models that we could use for the same operations within decimals. Now, here is our note. In this part, we're going to focus on procedures of computation. But we also need to make sure that we are emphasizing the concept of the operations. So uh, stuff that we learned in the whole number module, which was directly preceding this one, those also might be helpful to use here, as well as things we just talked about in part one of module seven. So what are the operations? Remember we have the big four, addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. Now, when we're focusing on rational number computation, we need to make sure that students really understand what does it mean to add, to subtract, to multiply, and to divide. When it comes to rational numbers, many students have a lot of misconceptions around the operations because they apply things that they learned from whole number instruction, they apply those things to rational number instruction. So for example, these comes from, this comes from the article about the 13 rules that expire. Maybe students have learned when multiplying by 10, just add zero at the end. Um, in subtraction, you can't take away a number that's greater from a number that's less. Subtracting and dividing always give you answers that are smaller. Adding and multiplying always give you answers that are greater. All of these things fall apart when it comes to rational numbers. So when you're teaching whole numbers, make sure you aren't saying these things because they're only halfway true. They only work for whole numbers. Those are our numbers zero and forward on the number line. But when it comes to rational numbers, these are our numbers that can be less than one. These, and also when it comes to integers, which are numbers that are less than zero, many of these rules fall apart. So don't emphasize them. Instead, focus on the correct concepts and procedures related to rational numbers. So let's start talking about uh, rational number operations. We're first going to focus on fractions, and we're also going to focus on addition. I'm going to model how we can teach students to add fractions. I'm going to start with fractions with like denominators. You may also call those common denominators. And then we'll move to fractions where the denominators are not the same. I'm going to do this problem first using my manipulative, so I'm going to mosey on over there, and then I'm going to come back and show you what this looks like with pictorial representations. So I'm going to do the concrete over there, do the pictorial representations here, and guess what? I always have the abstract there. So we have our C, our R, and our A, or you'll see them all in play in the next few minutes. So let's go ahead and solve this problem. One third, plus, or one fifth, plus three fifths. So let me figure out how I would set this up with my manipulatives. And wow, it's magical. It's already set up. This is the magical fairy dust that you see kind of um, by my skirt. So here I have the fraction 1 fifth. Remember when we're showing fractions, we always want to compare the fraction to the whole. So here is the fraction 1 fifth. And to that, I'm adding 3 fifths. 1, 2, 3. And again, always comparing to the whole. Now, when my fraction, fractional parts, when the parts are the same size or have the same value, we can add those together without having to do anything else. So if I want to start with one-fifth, I'm going to add these three one-fifth pieces to it. So one-fifth plus three-fifths equals four-fifths. Easy peasy, right? Now let's see what this looks like when we think about it with a pictorial representation. Here I have one-fifth. Remember, I've always got my part and my whole. And I want to add to that three-fifths. Notice I show the fraction separately, just like I did with my concrete model. And now I'm going to add the parts together. So I'm going to add these three one-fifth pieces to my one one-fifth piece. So I'm going to add, take that piece and add it, take the other one and the third one. So when I have one-fifth plus three-fifths, the answer is four-fifths. Very nice work. Now it's 
easy when the fractions are the same or common or like, whichever terminology you and your math textbook use. It's not as easy when we have fractions that don't have common denominators. So in this example, I'm going to add 1 half plus 1 fourth. I'm first going to do it with my manipulatives, and then I'll come back and show you what it would look like if we were drawing it with a pictorial representation. So I'm adding 1 half plus 1 fourth. I'm going to go ahead and scoot my uh, previous problem away. I'm going to keep out my holes. And in this problem, I'm adding 1 half. So I'm going to go ahead and get my 1 half there. And to that, I'm adding uh, 1 fourth. It was actually just 1 fourth. Now, it's hard to add these parts together because the parts are not the same size or they don't have the same value. When I'm adding parts, I need to add parts that have the same value. One half has a different value than one fourth. So my question is, how can I get one half to uh, be in parts where they have the same value as one fourth? Now this is an easier problem, but here I can either know or I can see that one half is equivalent to two one fourth pieces. And I can place those on top. Notice I'm not going to put them up here. I'm actually going to physically place them on top of the one half piece to show that those are the same size. So now I have two fourths plus one fourth. I'm going to add one fourth pieces. I can add those together because they are the same value. So I'll leave my two one fourth pieces and to that I will add one fourth. So two fourths plus one fourth is the same as three fourths. Now I'm going to scoot over here to my board because I'm going to draw this out um, with, uh, uh, on the board here. So I have one half plus two fourths. So we just did it with the concrete. I'm going to show it with the representational in a minute, but I want to go ahead and focus here on the abstract. I should not add a one half, a one half piece plus a one fourth piece, because remember, those fractions don't have the same, the fractional parts don't have the same value. So how do we often teach students to move from a situation where we don't have common denominators to a situation where we do? And this is where we write out our multiples. So I have a fraction with a denominator of two. And probably this is how you did this in school or how you teach this with your students. But I'm going to write out the first five multiples of two. That's usually going to get me to where I need to be. So let's see, our multiples are two, four, six, eight, and ten. And then I'm going to write out my multiples of four. First five, four, eight, twelve, sixteen, and twenty. Now let's see, do we have a least common multiple here? We do. The least common multiple, when I have a fraction with a denominator of two and a fraction with a denominator of four, is four. Now this tells me a little bit about how I can take that one half piece and break it into equal parts. I don't, I don't know if I want to say break, but I want to um, use equal parts to then get to the place where I have fractions with the same denominator. And I can actually show this on our, um, on our pictorial representation. So here's one half and here's one fourth. The question is, so I don't have to change the one fourth because it's already in, it uh, has the lowest common denominator here. But I am going to find an equivalent fraction where instead of a fraction that has a denominator of two, I want to change that to a fraction with a denominator of four. Which means I need to, and you can kind of think about this in two ways, I see two and four. So that means I need to take this one half piece and uh, change it to where it has two equal parts. Right now it just has one one-half piece. I want to break this into two equal parts. One, two. So then I now have my two equal parts. That's helpful when students are kind of like, well, how many equal parts do I need to, you know, change one-half into? Let's say if, if my common denominator is eight, I would have to break it into one, two, three, four equal parts. So that's where listing out these multiples is really helpful for students. 
Now that I have my pictorial representation, uh, my parts are all of the same size, they have the same value, it's very easy to add those together. I start with my one half and I add this one fourth piece. So one half plus one fourth is the same as three fourths. We did a really nice job on that addition. Now there's other ways that we can do this problem. So we have talked about um, using the fraction tiles, but we can also use those two color counters. We used those before uh, a little bit earlier in this, uh, in this module, and we're going to use them again. So I'm going to erase my work from the board so we don't get distracted by it. And then I'm going to move over here to use my concrete model of two color counters to solve the same problem. So here we go erased, and now I'm going to look at my two color counters. So I'm solving the same problem, one half plus one fourth. Here I have the fraction one half. Here I'm going to use my dark, or the red part of the counter. Oh, I'm gonna scoot that down a little bit. The red part of the counter to uh, show one half. So this is my parts. The, the red shows the part. The uh, yellow helps show the denominator. And to that, I'm adding one fourth. Here is the fraction one fourth. Now, this is where students really have to think about fractions. And it's one of the reasons that using the two color counters is somewhat helpful. I think that I could add these parts because they are the same size. But remember, it's not just same size. They have to have the same value. Right now, this red counter uh, shows us that that's one half. This red counter is, represents one fourth. Those do not have the same value. So I need to get to the point where these do have the same value, which means I have a fraction with a denominator of four, a fraction with a denominator of two, and I have to figure out how to get these to be a common denominator. Now, we've already done our multiples and things like that, um, but I need to, uh, I can do this two ways. I can list out my multiples and see like, oh, I need to make um, a second uh, iteration of the fraction. I can also problem solve. I can add, uh, or basically it's not adding, this is iterating. I can iterate this fraction, which means just making a copy of it to get to the point where both denominators are the same. So I have a fraction with a denominator of two. I iterate the fraction one time. Now I have an equivalent fraction to one half, which is two fourths. I've iterated it. And here I have a fraction with a denominator of four, a fraction with a denominator of four. Now these red parts represent the same thing. They each represent one fourth. So I'm going to add fractions. I'm going to add my one fourth pieces and I'm still going to make groups of four because remember that's my denominator. So let's see, I'm going to make a group of four. One, two, three, four, and then these yellow counters, these are just holding place. I can make a second group of four, but they don't, doesn't really represent anything. So when I have two fourths and I add one fourth, my answer is three fourths. Now let's go back and look at our pictorial representation. I need to push pause here because I think I have this again and I don't know why. I'm gonna, is, is it okay if I start right here? Yeah, that's okay. It doesn't matter to me. Is it okay? Okay. I mean, it's just like me looking down anyway. All right, now let's look at what this problem would look like in the pictorial representation form. We just did the concrete. Now let's see the representational. Here's one half, here's one fourth. Remember, I cannot add these counters together because they don't have the same value. So I'm gonna iterate the fraction of, to figure out one half is equivalent to two fourths, and now it's adding time. I'm going to add my fractional parts together. So one half plus one fourth equals three fourths. I can move all of those there. They're just, those represent zero. They're just holding place. So one half, plus one-fourth equals three-fourths. The nice thing about these counters is they just show a different way to help students see uh, addition with fractions. I'm gonna use the fraction bars a lot today, the two color counters a lot today. You can also use the geo boards, the Cuisinaire rods, the fraction circles, lots of different ways to help students see what happens when we're adding fractions. But the emphasis here is that we were adding the parts of the fraction the denominators stayed the same. 
Once I got to the point where I had a common denominator, I was only adding the parts. And that's what needs to be emphasized for students when they're adding fractions. So now let's think about subtracting fractions. Let's do this one here, 4 fifths minus 1 fifth. I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to set it up over here with my concrete manipulatives, and then I'll come over and show the pictorial representation. Let's look at the concrete manipulatives now. So we're doing the problem 4 fifths minus 1 fifth. So I'm going to get out my whole. Remember, we always want to show our whole. And I'm going to have, get out my four one-fifth pieces. Now, I want to always uh, talk with students about how fraction computation is similar to whole number computation. And that squeaky sound is my marker. So I want you to, let's not, let's, I'm going to scoop my fractions up there for just a minute. And let's talk about the problem four minus one. If we solve this with whole numbers, I have four, and I think about this as taking away one. At least that's one of the ways to think about it. So four, take away one, is three. We do the same thing with fractions. Here, I have four one-fifth pieces, and I need to take away one-fifth piece. So I, this, I don't have to do anything fancy here. I have four-fifths. And I'm going to take away by slowly moving it off of the screen, one-fifth. And then how many parts does that leave, with me, leave me with? Three one-fifth pieces. So showing students what the subtraction means with whole numbers and then how that relates to rational numbers, you can really see the connection there with what I just did. First, I subtracted the whole numbers, and then I just added the fractions in there. It's no big deal. But a lot of students get nervous about it because it does seem like something totally different, but it's subtraction in the same way that we thought about subtraction before. So now let's switch over and look at our pictorial representation here. Same problem. Here I have my four-fifths. How many pieces do I need to take away? I need to take one one-fifth piece. I have a bunch of one-fifth pieces here, so it's really easy to take one away. There it goes. There it goes away. So four-fifths minus one-fifth equals three-fifths. Now, when you're emphasizing this with the abstract, we want to emphasize that the denominator is not changing. That's because we are not doing anything with the denominator. So what a lot of teachers will do is actually go ahead and say, you know, like, we're working in fifths. So I'm going to go ahead and write a five to show that that five is my denominator. And then remember, I'm taking the parts away that are the fractional parts. So four, uh, a part, four one-fifth pieces minus one one-fifth piece is three one-fifth pieces. So tying in that abstract work as much as you can for students. Now the next fraction that we're going to look at is a fraction where we do not have common denominators. Let me go ahead and erase my work there, and we'll click over to the next slide. So now we're going to work on this problem, seven-eighths minus two-fourths. Let's go ahead and see what it looks like when we're solving it with the concrete manipulatives. So seven-eighths minus two-fourths. And I may need to erase my former work here and make some noise while I'm doing that. That's okay. Okay. A lot of noise while I'm doing that. Okay. So we're doing the problem seven-eighths minus two-fourths. My gosh, I like to challenge myself and get out lots of manipulative pieces here today. So I'll go ahead and get these out, 7 eighths minus 2 fourths. Double check that my work is correct. All right, 7 eighths minus 2 fourths. There's a few ways that we can think about solving this problem. Now, I need to take away 2 fourths. Some students may know that 2 fourths is equivalent to 4 eighths. If they know that, great. You are doing a very nice job teaching students about fractions. But if they don't know that, there's a few different ways that we can go about figuring out how many parts do you need to subtract. So one of those ways is to get uh, two one-fourth pieces. So I'm going to go ahead and set this up with another fraction. So here's the set where I'm going to take away, and here is the set that's for my reference. And I'm going to just use this reference set to figure out 
what one two fourths is equivalent to in terms of eighths. So I'm going to get out my eighth pieces, and I can see. Well, let's see. One fourth is equivalent to two eighths, and this other fourth is equivalent to two eighths. So remember, this is just for my reference. And in fact, if you want to, sometimes I like to write. We'll just write R E F. This is for my reference only. I'm not going to do anything with this set here. So I see that two fourths is equivalent to four eighths. So for my reference, I need to take away one, two, three, four one eighth pieces. So let's go ahead and do that. One, two, three, four one eighth pieces. So seven eighths minus four eighths is the same as three eighths. Now another way that I can do this is I can just start with my seven eighths there. I'm going to erase my reference mark there. Try not to be as noisy this time. And now I'm going to be a little bit more uh, of a problem solver here. So I have my seven eighths, and I need to take away two fourths. So I can actually place those fourths over the eighths to figure out how many do I need to take away. Here I can see that two fourths is equivalent to four eighths. So I'm going to take away four one eighth pieces. Seven eighths minus three eighths is the same as th seven eighths minus four eighths is the same as three eighths. A lot of eighths talking, and that's really hard to say. Try to say it a few times fast. I'm not going to do that. I'm instead going to go to the pictorial representations. So here I have seven eighths. Remember, this is the set that I'm going to take away from. And for my reference, I need to take away two fourths. And it's in this reference set where I can find the equivalent fraction. Here I have fraction parts with the denominator four. I want to be able to take away eighths. So what is equivalent to two fourths? Four eighths. So for my reference, see how it says this uh, is for reference. I need to take away four one eighth pieces. So I'll go ahead and take those away. So seven eighths minus two fourths is the same as three eighths. Now you can list out the multiples there and do the same thing of finding common denominators. Whatever you do for addition also works for subtraction. Now before we head into multiplication and division, I want to look at our two color counters to show that we can think about these problems in different ways. And instead of showing mine with the concrete manipulatives, I'm just going to show mine on screen. So here I have seven eighths. Right now, each of these red counters represents one eighth. And for my reference, I need to take away two fourths. Now these represent right now, each of those represent one fourth. I don't know how to um, take away fourths from eighths, so we want to find common denominators. So let's see, when I list out my denominator, so I have four, eight, twelve, so I he see here that the common denominator is eight, and that means I'm going to iterate this set of four, four to eight, that's just one iteration, so I'll iterate that set one time, I think it's starting to subtract from there, so I apologize for that, and I need to take away four eighths pieces, so I took away one already, two, three, and four, I think, oh my gosh, it's not working today. And you know what happens when that doesn't work? When I've done the wrong stuff, I'm just going to cross that one out there. So seven eighths minus two fourths is the same as three eighths. Sorry that my two color counters on screen are acting up. Who knew they could be set, um, explain, <laughs> displaying such bad behavior today. But now it's time for you to do a workbook activity. I want you to solve the addition problems using two different fraction models. Probably most of you will use the fraction tiles and the two color counters, but be creative. Use the fraction circles. Use your geo board. Use the Cuisinier rods. Use your Legos. Remember, we showed lots of different ways that we can display and understand fractions. And then I want you to solve two subtraction problems using, or a subtraction problem using two different fractional models. Go ahead, have fun. All right, welcome back. We are talking about fraction procedures and now we head into multiplication and division, which might just be some of the harder things to explain in mathematics. I was actually talking to the recorders back here, Marnie and Michael, that it's so nice of them to let me record this because it's so complicated to explain. But I'm really gonna try to do a good job explaining how you can help students understand not just the procedure of multiplying and dividing fractions, but what it actually means. 
So let's go ahead and get started. I've got my little blackboard here because I'm going to do some math. I want you to just watch me. This is probably how, um, I'll get into my blackboard, this is probably how most of you multiply fractions. I write the fraction and then what do we do? We multiply the numerators, 1 times 4 is 4, and we multiply the denominators, 2 times 4 is 8. So our answer is 4 eighths. Can you explain what that means? So if a student asks, well, well, how did we get that answer? And more importantly, if a student has to problem solve around fraction computation, they need to understand and you need to teach them how this actually works out. So let's look at what it looks like when we are looking at a pictorial representation of this part, of this problem. Now before I do the pictorial representation, there's one thing I want to talk about, and it's this multiplication symbol right here. This multiplication symbol, well, let's see, I'll write it right up here. When I multiply three times two, in the module about whole numbers, we talked about the meaning of this symbol. And this really means three groups of two. And now let's take that same meaning and apply it to our fraction problem. This is a one half group of, I'll write that right underneath, well, maybe right underneath, wow, that's, I'll spread it out so it almost <laughs> looks like it there. We need to find a one half group of four fourths. Now the word times is, it's, uh, it's kind of like equals. It doesn't really mean a lot to students. But if you say of, that has such a deeper meaning. So three groups of two, I can totally visualize what that looks like. And if I need a one half group of four fourths, that's much more meaningful than if I were to say, oh, I need one half times four fourths. So I'm going to erase my whole number example here. And let's look at what this looks like with our pictorial representation. So here I have my whole. And remember, this is, I'm taking one half of four fourths. So when I multiply fractions, you're always going to show the second fraction or the second factor. So here is my four fourths. Now I need to take one half of four fourths. So what would that look like? Here's the four fourths. I'll scoot all the way to the side. Would you agree with me that this is one half of the four fourths? It is. There's one half of four fourths. So one half of four fourths is this area right here. And that ends up being two one fourth pieces. So one half of four fourths is two fourths, and it's also equivalent to four eighths. So that's what's happening. I'm taking one half of four fourths, and one half of four fourths is four eighths. Now I'm going to erase my work up here because we're going to go to our next problem and I don't want it to be distracting on the, um, on the glass board here. And I'll try not to erase, uh, I'll erase my of because I'll probably write it in there again. Let's look at our next problem here. Now we're going to do one half times two fourths. But don't think about it as one half times two fourths. Let's think about it as one half of two fourths a much better interpretation of the multiplication. So if I'm taking one half of two fourths, I'm going to show the fraction two fourths, okay? Now last time we took one half of four fourths, so I spread out and let you see the whole screen. Now it's totally fine for me to stand here because I'm going to take one half of this area right here. I'm not taking one half of four fourths, we're finding one half of two fourths, the yellow area right here. Look at this, I actually covered up a little bit more. What would be one half of this area here? One half of this area here, it would be this part of the fraction. That's one half of two fourths. So good job, yay, we found one half of two fourths, but we're not done. We have to figure out what our answer is. We never left a fraction 
with a, um, with a denominator of four. We were always in fourths. Go, I had took one half of these two fourths. So this area right here, one half of two fourths is one. Now I'll scoop back. Remember, we were always in fourths. My answer is one fourth. Now, if you do the multiplication up here, so one times two is two. Put my little equal sign right in there. Two times four is eight. Two eighths is equivalent to one fourth. And what you can do here is visually show what it means to multiply one half times two fourths. You're basically taking one half of two fourths, and that is equivalent to two eighths. So I hope it's starting to make some sense here. I'm going to erase my work, and we're going to look at another fraction. And I'll spend a little bit more time with the next one because it's a little bit trickier. I've made them kind of easy so far. Now we're going to do one half times three fourths, or one half of three fourths. So I'm going to show my second factor my second fraction here. So there's three fourths. And I'm going to take one half of this three fourths area. So I'm not taking one half of four fourths. I'm not taking one half of two fourths. Cover that up. I kind of like that. I'm taking one half of three fourths. So what would be one half of this three fourths area? Would you agree with me that it would be this, what this, this green line is kind of showing me? There's one half of three fourths. So now I have, I did the multiplication. Now we have to figure out what my answer is. So one half of three fourths is this space right to here in a fraction with this hole. And it's kind of hard to figure this one out. So maybe I will end up breaking each of these pieces into, uh, each of the one fourth pieces into eighths. So one half of three fourths is one, two, three of the four, five, six, seven, eight pieces. So it is three eighths. And if you do the multiplication, one times three is three, two times four is eight, three eighths. And here I've also shown my three eighths. Now that's a little bit hard for some students to visualize. So I'm gonna show you some other ways to think about solving this same problem. And some of these may click for students in a different way. Remember, as a teacher, you need to fill that instructional toolbox up with lots of different ways to show what it means to show fractions and to multiply fractions. So I'm showing you lots of different ways, and I'm hoping it's helping you understand multiplication of fractions so that you can uh, teach it to your students. So 1 half times 3 fourths, uh, we've got it this way. Let's look at it on a number line. So 1 half of 3 fourths. So I'm first going to fill in my number line all the way up to 3 fourths, and then I'm going to take one half of this blue line. Remember, because I'm taking one half of the 3 fourths. One half gets me to this space here on the number line, which that is equivalent to 3 eighths. So one half times 3 fourths equals 3 eighths. Here it is with the area model. And now I'm going to do this one just a little bit differently. So I have 3 1 fourth pieces. And I could take one half of these pieces. So, oh my gosh, I'm just going to challenge myself today. I could take one half of these pieces, and please bear with me as I don't draw very good circle, circular things. Would you agree with me that one half of the three fourths is this pink area here? All right, I could actually shade it in, but I'm not going to do that because I'm going to very quickly erase this. And, and I do that, my microphone fell out of my back pocket. So I'm going to ignore me putting it back in my skirt. And there we go. Okay, so I can also think about this problem is I can take one half of the entire three-fourths, or I can take one half of each of the one-fourth pieces. Let me show you what that means. And my gosh, I have just challenged myself by drawing this. All right, so I would say, whew, squeak, here is a one-fourth piece, and I'm going to take one-half of that piece, and so one-half of this one-fourth piece 
is this area here. Now I'm going to take one half, because remember that's the fraction that we're working on, one half of this one fourth piece. So let me go ahead and draw this. I actually am going to say, I'm going to give myself a pat on the back. This is hard to do, and I'm doing an amazing job today. So good job, Sarah. Lots of reinforcement for myself. All right, so there's one half of this one fourth piece. And then finally, I'm going to take one half. Um, now that I've said I was doing a good job, I'm not doing as well. I'm going to do one half of this one fourth piece. So you can think about taking one half of the entire three fourths, or you can think about taking one half of each of the one fourth pieces. And once I've done that, now I've broken this fraction into one, two, three, four, five, six, I have to keep going, seven, eight equal parts. So now I have a fraction with a denominator of eight and one half of each of the one, uh, three one-fourth pieces is one, two, three. So that equals three eighths. Now that was kind of hard to do with a, with a visual with a circle, but it's totally possible to do, and it's a really nice visual to show students. But I can also do this with my fraction bars. And I'll go ahead and draw this one out. So here is my hole. I'm going to break this into four about equal parts. And I'm going to go ahead and, um, how am I going to do this? Uh, I'll just put little dots in here, okay, to show there's one of my one-fourth pieces, Here's two of my one-fourth pieces and three of my one-fourth pieces. Now I want to take one half of each of the three one-fourth pieces. So one half of this piece would be, I'm going to break it into half. And I'm going to shade that half pretty hard. I'm going to break this piece into one half and shade one half of it. And I'm going to break this one-fourth piece into half and shade half of it. Now if I'm breaking each of these one fourth pieces into half, I also have to break that one into half, but I'm not going to do any shading because remember this is not part of the fraction that I'm working with in multiplication. So now I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight pieces of my fraction and one half of three fourths is one, two, three of those pieces. So my answer is three eighths. I just have to pause here to erase. Did you record that whole thing or did, okay, good. <laughs> Sarah's grandma is sick. Okay. All right. Now let's look at this problem one more time because now I want to show you how we can do this with the two color counters. One half of three fourths. Remember, we don't want to think about that as times. So here I have my three-fourths out, and I'm going to take one half of each of those. So I'm going to break these each into one half, and I'll call it, kind of color it in. This time it's going to do it for me. There's one half of this one-fourth piece, one half of this one-fourth piece, and one half of this one-fourth piece. And remember, oh my gosh, excuse me, I just burped from my lunch. <laughs> this would also be broken into um, a, a piece, so we would have, uh, our, now we're in eighths. And then I would have one, two, three eighths. So that's one half of three fourths. Now, multiplication of fractions is really difficult to, for students to understand. And you might say, well, why do students need to understand what it means to multiply fractions when they can just multiply those numerators and multiply those denominators? It comes when students aren't presented with a problem in this form. So many times students will be presented with a word problem. And there they have to figure out, well, am I multiplying or am I dividing? Like, what am I doing here? And so no high stakes assessment asks students to solve multiplication problems like this. They might ask students to solve a multiplication problem like this. So I might say, uh, I, last night I ordered a pizza. And after eating some of the pizza, I had three-fourths of the pizza remaining. Today for lunch, I ate one-half of that pizza, or one-half of the remaining pizza. How much pizza did I eat? And the answer to that is you ate three-eighths of the entire pizza. So it's questions like that 
where students need to have these visuals. Here I could imagine that this is the three-fourths of the pizza remaining, and then I ate one-half of each of those slices. And so these visuals really help students understand what it means to multiply fractions. Now if we thought that was fun, let's go to division of fractions. So here when I have division of fractions, I'm going to ask myself a question. And the question is, how many of the second fraction, and I'm actually going to circle this right there, how much of the second fraction can I make, or you might also say fit into, the, the first fraction? So here I want to figure out how many one-third pieces can I make if I have two-thirds of a fraction? So how many one-third pieces can I make with two-thirds of a fraction. So if I'm going to figure out how many of the second fraction fits into the first, in division you're always going to show the first fraction, which makes sense because in multiplication you always showed the second fraction. And there's this nice inverse relationship between multiplication and division. So let's show the second or the first fraction here. My gosh. Here is two thirds. Now I'm only going to focus on this yellow part right here. I'm not focusing on the red hole. That's just there to tell me um, what the hole was of this fraction. But I'm going to figure out how many one-third pieces can I make if I'm given or presented with two-thirds. So I can fit one full set of one-third. And I've still got more remaining. I can fit, now I'm going to cross that out, I can fit two sets of one-third. So when I have two-thirds and I divide it by one-third, my answer is two. I can fit one, two sets of one-third into a group of two-thirds. Now probably a lot of you learned division of fractions like this. You might say, I don't know the reason why just invert and multiply. And so then you multiply the denominator, or numerators, and you multiply the denominators. You end up with six thirds, and hmm, six thirds is equivalent to two. But instead of focusing on this invert and multiply thing, it's much better students understand fractions at a deeper understanding when you ask them to figure out how many groups of one third can you fit into two-thirds? And this also comes through in problem solving. So let me give you the following problem. Let's say I like to bake. Probably a lot of you like to bake too. And I want to bake some batches of brownies. So I look into the cabinet and I see I've got two-thirds of a cup of sugar. That's all I have remaining of all the sugar in my cabinet. And I look at my recipe and it says each batch of brownies needs one-third of a cup of sugar. So how many batches of brownies can I make? So remember, I've got two-thirds a cup of sugar in the closet, and each batch needs one-third of a cup of sugar. So how many batches can I make? I can make one full batch of brownies. I can make a second full batch of brownies. So when I have two-thirds of a cup of sugar, and each batch requires one-third of a cup of sugar, how many batches can I make? I can make two batches of brownies. And that is why students need to have these visuals, is so that they can understand problems like that. Now I'm going to do a little bit of erasing, and we're going to solve a few more division problems here. And while I'm erasing, I want you to think about how do you interpret the problem here, all right? So what do you ask yourself when you are dividing fractions. So here's our next problem. 5 6 divided by 1 half. Now that doesn't really help me out that much. But instead I could ask how many sets or how many groups of 1 half can I make if I have 5 6. So sometimes people say make 
Other times people say fit into. I think you need to reflect upon the math terminology that's used in your textbook and that your students are familiar with. Um, I'll probably go back and forth so you can see how both of those work. But in this problem I'll say how many groups of one half can I make with five sixths? So I'm going to show five sixths. Here's my hole and there there are my five one-sixth pieces. Now I'm going to bring in my one-half piece. My one-half piece is there. So I'm going to figure out how many of these one-half pieces can I make with five-sixths. So I can make one full group of one-half. So I'll go ahead and write my one there. Now with my, there's my one set of one-half. In my next group of one-half, I can't make an entire, uh, an entire set here. So I'm not, I can't make a second set of one half, but how much of this set of one half can I make with this part here? And I can make one, two of three parts. So I can make two thirds of the next group of one half. So my answer is two, one and two thirds. Now if we do the work here, five, six, invert and multiply, I multiply my numerators and multiply my denominators and believe it or not, ten sixths is the same as one and two thirds. And in fact what I did here was probably a little bit easier than what I do here with this procedure. But I asked myself how many groups of one half can I make with five sixths I could make one full group of one half and then two thirds of the next group of one half. Now another way to see it that I can leave here, uh, leave all my writing up there, is here I have five sixths and one half of five sixths would be this red area ringed here. So I can make one full group of one half and then how much of the next group of one half can I make? I can make one two out of three. So one and two thirds. I can also do it with the two color counters. Here is five sixths. Here's one half of five sixths. So I can make one full group of what five sixths and two thirds of the next group of five sixths. So many different ways that we can visualize this problem. Now I'm going to leave my work up there. I'm sorry if it's going to be distracting on the screen, but let's go ahead and look at workbook activity number five. You're going to solve a multiplication problem and you also solve a division problem. And I want you to show two different ways to help model those. So you've got your fraction bars, your fraction circles, your two color counters. You could use the number line, many different ways to solve these problems. But go ahead and give them a try. So now that we've thought a lot about modeling of fractions, we can also think about modeling of decimals. So I'm going to solve two different problems here. First, I'm going to do one and 25 hundredths plus 95 hundredths, and we'll go ahead and start that there. And because I'm gonna have a hard time remembering that problem, I'm gonna go ahead and write it here to the side. Uh, I will write it a little bit further down so everyone at home can see it. Um, one and 25 hundredths plus 95 hundredths. Notice how when I'm talking about these decimals, I'm using very nice math language. I'm not saying 1.25, that's informal, that's not a good thing to do. Instead of saying 1 and 25 hundredths plus 95 hundredths. So uh, we've used these before. These are our nice base 10 blocks. And we don't have to use our base 10 blocks just for thinking about whole numbers. We can also use them for thinking about rational numbers, such as decimals. So here, we change the meaning of our base 10 blocks. Now my flat represents one, my uh, rod represents tenths, and my unit represents hundredths. So first I'm going to show one and 25 hundredths. So I've got my one there, and now I have two tenths, and now I have five hundredths, so one and 25 hundredths. And to that, I'm adding 95. Wow, I like to challenge myself and get out all the tenths that I have over here. 95 hundredths. All right, so I've got that set up. Um, it's a little bit hard for you to see everything I've got there, but you can see I have 95 hundredths and I'm ready to add. 
Now, what do you notice about the abstract form of my problem and the concrete form of my problem? They match. So notice here, 1 and 25 hundredths right there is set up on the top. 95 hundredths is set up down here on the bottom. Now I'm going to use a traditional algorithm to add these together. So first I'm going to add together all my hundredths. And whenever I have more than nine hundredths, I need to regroup. So let's see what we've got. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I know that, wow, popcorn today in the hundredths. Ten hundredths is the same as one tenth. And I like to place it up here on the top, but it's going to be hard for you to see that, so I'll kind of place it right there. And if I was following along with my abstract work, now I have zero hundredths, and I regrouped my one tenth. Now we're going to add together all the tenths. Whenever I have more than nine tenths, it's time to regroup. Let's see how many we have. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Ten tenths, popcorn tenths also there is the same as one, so I'll regroup that there. And I end up having um, two tenths, and I regroup one. And then I add my holes, or my ones together, and I end up with two. So when I add one and 25 hundredths and 95 hundredths, my answer, or my sum, is two and two tenths, or two and 20 hundredths. And the base 10 blocks can help me see how to solve a problem like that. Now I'm going to go to my subtraction problem. I'll just go ahead and erase my addition problem here. And wow, I'm making some a nice mess here on the desk. I'll have to apologize to the person whose desk I'm writing on. Now we are going to do two and four hundredths. And now we are subtracting one and sixty-four hundredths. So two and four hundredths minus one and sixty-four hundredths. So I'm going to get up uh, my first number. We call that our minuend. Not everybody uses that formal language, but that's what it is. So I have two and four hundredths. Notice how I don't have any tenths out here because I do not have any tenths in my number. And now it's time for me to subtract. This is my subtrahend. I need to subtract one and sixty-four hundredths. Now the easiest thing to do is to think about subtraction as taking away. So I'm going to look in each place value column and I'm going to take away the correct amount. So first I need to start here and I need to take away four hundredths. I can take away four hundredths, one, two, three, four. I'm going to slide them off of my workspace. I've taken away four hundredths. Now I need to take away six tenths. Do we have any tenths to take away? No. So guess what time it is? It is time for regrouping. I can exchange one whole for ten tenths because those are equivalent. So now I have ten tenths and I can take away six tenths. One, two, three, four, five, six. Slide those off my mat. And then I need to look at my whole. I need to take away one. I will go ahead and take away one away. And then I end up with four tenths. Now let's check the abstract form of this number to make sure we did the math correctly. Four, take away four is zero. Here I have to regroup. Ten minus six is four. One minus one is zero. So when I have two and four hundredths minus one and sixty-four hundredths, my answer is four tenths or forty hundredths. And my concrete pictures can help me with that. You could also draw this in de with the decimal form. A lot of people will uh, just draw like a nice big uh, flat there. So there's my, and I could draw two of them. So there's my two, and then maybe for the four, I draw little boxes. Sometimes people do X's or circles, and then I could take away uh, accordingly from there. So we can do it with the concrete, we can do it with the representational, and students also need to be able to do the problem in the abstract. Now I'm going to erase one more time because I have something that uh, is up on that we can do that's not up on my slides. And in fact, when I erase this time, I'm going to pause because I'm going to wipe this off with Windex because it is very messy. I'll be right back. Okay. Now we're going to look at a few problems that I didn't put on the presentation but are important to think about. And then we can also do decimal work 
with multiplication and division. So first I'm going to do uh, 26 hundredths. My gosh, I should write this down. I'll just start over. Now we're going to think about how we can do multiplication and division with decimals with our base 10 blocks. So I'm going to do the problem. <laughs> now we're going to think about how we can do decimal multiplication and division with the base 10 blocks. So I've written a problem here, 26 hundredths times 2. So I could think about that as 26 hundredths groups of 2, or I could use the commutative property to do two groups of 26 hundredths. That is much easier. So I'm going to do two groups of 26 hundredths. Here is one group of 26 hundredths. Notice I've got my tenths and my hundredths and my rods and my units. And then here is another group of 26 hundredths. Get it out here. Now, remember multiplication is the same as repeated addition, so I can add my hundredths and add my tenths. Whenever I have more than nine, I have to regroup. With my hundredths, I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Ten hundredths is the same as one-tenth. And when I add my tenths, I do not have to regroup. I only have five. So tw twenty-six hundredths times two is the same as ten, twenty, thirty, forty, fifty or five tenths, two and two hundredths, so fifty-two hundredths. Now anything we do with multiplication, we can also do with division. So I'm going to erase my problem here and write a division problem. And I'll scoot my base ten blocks off of my mat so I don't get distracted by them. Um, this time I'm going to do four, see how many groups uh, how many, four groups of one and thirty-two hundredths, or one and thirty-two hundredths divided by four. Now, one of the things when I solve this problem, when I use the traditional way, I first ask myself, well, how many times or how many groups of four can I make with one? How many groups of four can I make with three tenths? How many groups of four can I make with two hundredths? And we're going to follow this same process with division with the uh, concrete manipulatives. So I'm going to show 1 and 32 hundredths. And I'm going to break those into four groups. So the first thing I need to figure out is how to take this whole and break it into four equal groups. Well, there's not four of them, so I need to exchange. Remember, one whole is the same as 10 tenths. And now I can take my tenths and break them into four equal groups. So I'm going to put them over here to the side, kind of align them differently. So one, two, three, four. I've got my four groups. And I can still distribute my tenths here. So now there will be two tenths in each group. And I still have tenths to distribute. So now I will have three tenths in each of my four groups. Now with this last tenth, you can kind of see that down there at the bottom there. My last tenth, I can't break that evenly into four groups, so I'm going to exchange this. Remember that one tenth is the same as ten, uh, ten hundredths. So I'll go ahead and do my exchanging there. And now I'm going to equally share or distribute my hundredths. So I'll distribute them among the four groups. And I'll keep distributing until I have none left or I have a remainder. And this problem, it's kind of easy. They all can be distributed. So when I have 132 hundredths and I divide it by 4, uh, my answer is 1, 2, 3, uh, 3 tenths and 3 hundredths, or 33 hundredths. That's how many are in each group. So now let's look to workbook activity number 6. So with our workbook activity number 6, you're going to review the multiplicative schemas for, from the module on instructional strategies. And I want you to figure out how you would use two different schemas to describe the following problem. Good luck. So why is all of this important? Oftentimes, students can do computation, but really don't understand the why. Why does this work? How does this work? 
And one of the things that we've been working with you across this module and some of the other modules is filling your toolbox. So making sure that you have the tools to be able to explain the how and why of computation when students have difficulty with it. Now a few considerations. Everything that we were doing today, especially stuff with the fractions where we were listing the multiples, when you have a strong understanding of the math facts, that's really going to help us here with the computation. And in fact, you saw that when I was just doing the stuff with the decimals. I was like, oh, 4 plus 4 is 8. If you know 4 plus 4 is 8, it makes everything that you do much easier. So even if you're providing intensive intervention around facts, or uh, not around facts, around fractions or decimals, you should be making sure that students have a strong understanding of their whole number facts. And the same thing here with the second bullet point. Many times your whole number operations relate to your rational number operations. So making sure that students have a strong understanding with whole number understanding before we get to anything we do with rational numbers. So let's get to our checklist. In this module, we are focusing on rational number procedures. So I hope that you will take the following to your teaching. I'd like you to understand different models for showing and drawing computation with fractions. We did a lot of that today. We just talked about place value concepts with decimals and how we can help students see those concepts. And then for everything that we've been doing today, making sure you're using the appropriate language to describe what does it mean to add, subtract, multiply, and divide with fractions or decimals. So it's time to hit up the discussion board. I'd like you to reflect upon the word problem schema of ratios and proportions. This was covered in a previous uh, instructional module. And how could you use some of the information in this module to help students understand what is a ratio? What does unit rate mean? Unit rate mean? What are proportions and what are percentages? So try to make these connections between this module, module 7, and some of our previous modules. Have fun.